So welcome to our monthly call. I do want to preface that this call will be a little bit longer than our normal hour, hour long sessions, but we have a lot packed. So hopefully you can stay. If not, please be sure to reach out to either teams for information and we'll be circulating the video when it's done. We are very excited to be teaming up with Archipelago, uh, the Metro NYC team for this community call. And we hope to make web archiving more accessible with this hands-on workshop for using both tools. So we scheduled so that each team can explain the tools and do a small uh, demo on how to use the tools. So we can do the main event, which is for all of you to web archive and become your own curators for your web collections. It'll be exciting. Uh, you'll get hands-on experience, great opportunity to try out new things, to mess up and have colleagues around you who can help. So it's gonna be fun. No better way to learn. So let's do it. First, um, first team up is the web recorder team. My name is Lorena Ramirez Lopez. I am the community manager for the web recorder project and I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Emma Dixon. I am a general developer on the web recorder team. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about it and answer questions. I think it'll be fun. Hi everyone, I'm Ilya Kramer. I'm the lead developer and creator of the web recorder project. Uh, yeah, really great to have all of you here for this joint uh, community call and workshop. So Web Recorder Project builds tools to specializing in user form web archiving, where the user is able to direct archiving processes through their browser. We have a lot of tools, but our four key tools, um, our four key tools are Replay Web Page, Archive Web Page, PyWB, and Browser Tricks Crawler. We'll be having a hands-on experience with Archive Web Page to capture our websites. And I should mention, if you want to introduce yourselves in the chat, just so we know who is here, the Metro NYC team is going to introduce themselves when the time comes for their section. So our team believes in web archiving for all. So the goal of Web Recorder Tools is to provide highly accurate capture and replay with a variety of um, storage options and services. We're working on documentation, videos, and outreach like these calls to make open source tools for web archiving easier. And just so that we're on the same page, web archiving can take many forms, but it usually involves fully capturing websites, storing the captured content, and reproducing or replaying the archive sites. We use the International Internet Preservation Consortium's definition, which is web archiving is the process of collecting portions of the World Wide Web, preserving the collections in an archival format, and then serving the archives for access and use. And why archive the web? So the internet is not forever, even though it seems like it is. A 2012 study had stated that after the first year of publishing, nearly 11% of shared web resources will be lost. And after that, we will continue to lose 0.2% like per day. And I can imagine that number only grew. And like any archival process, there are standards. And we store the raw internet data in a work file, which is literally web archive formats. It's an ISO standard. So the tools recognize this standard. But because work is such raw data, the web recorder team developed Waxy to bundle that data into something more useful. And with that, I'll pass it along to Emma to explain the Waxy format. Waxy format. <laughs> um, yeah, so like Lorena just said, a lot of the information is traditionally stored in a work file. And so Web Recorder has been working on a new file format called the Waxy format, which is basically, it stands for Web Archive Collection Zipped. So it's a work file with a bunch of other information all zipped up. And I tried to convey this, uh, I made this graphic myself. So if it helps, you can think of a Waxy as sort of a pyramid 
that unfolds to reveal these different files that will help you create a web archive. So we use the data, the frictionless data package standard, um, which means that we have a metadata file that conforms to that standard that has information um, that you can check to make sure your files aren't experiencing data rot, um, to compare hashes, things like that. And so basically it's a zip file that bundles work data in a single pack package, along with indexes, a full text search, a pages.jsonl file, and other meta metadata. And I tried to show that in this little visual so you can see the base is an archive and that's where your raw work file would be stored. So if you unzipped the zip file, you would see an archive folder which had the work files that you collected, an indexes folder that would have an index.idx or .cdx file, a pages folder that would have a pages.jsonl file, and the data package.json file, which was the frictionless data compliant thing I mentioned earlier. And so the benefit of having this, the, the point of taking a work file, which is a standard and including all of these other standardized things together, is that it makes it really easy to host your own web archive. This is sort of everything that you would need to have a comprehensive web archive. It also provides fast access without having to download the complete archive. You can use the zip format to access things a lot easier and quicker than you can with just a raw work. So the big difference between work and Waxy is that a work is raw data and Waxy is fully cooked with additional ingredients. I like that. Um, yeah, so I think that's sort of the rundown on Waxy. Um, oh, so I forgot to mention, which I think people have copies of, is there's a link to the GitHub if people are interested in. Um, we are open source, so if you had any suggestions, you could open an issue um, or our forums. So what is archiveweb.page? Um, I'm going to start with the shorter answer, which is that it's a web archiving tool for capture that you can use from your browser or desktop. And the technical back end of it is that it's a JavaScript based system that can be used on Chrome or Chromium based browser extensions. Um, so you can download it in the Chrome store and have it in your browser, or you can get a standalone app version. And basically it takes the waxy file um, or the work file and it helps you actually turn it into something you can view. Because if you just click on those files when you download them, if you have a work or a waxy on your computer and you click on it, your computer's not going to do anything to it. It's not going to know what it's looking at. It's not going to have a program automatically that will open it and let you look at a, a fully functional web page. So this is where archiveweb.page comes in. So some of its features that you might find helpful, um, there's interactive browser-based archiving, there's full text search. And I've said full text search a couple of times um, and I didn't bother defining it, but it basically just means that if you know, you're looking for, a, say, a particular piece of art in this really big collection, and you searched um, Portrait of a Kid on Fire, say that's the title, because it's a Wojnarowicz piece, if you searched that, it would pop up with all of the pages that that was referenced on, anywhere that that appeared, um, which is really helpful if you're dealing with sort of a sprawling and confusing archive. Uh, it also has Waxy and Work exports, automated page interactions, which means autopilot. So if you can basically just check a box and have it archive some of the more complex actions for you. So you don't have to be scrolling down through an entire long page. Um, and it also has flash archiving. We use Ruffle, which is a pretty um, established flash emulator. And that just makes it a little bit easier if you're looking at an older page and you're wondering what it used to look like. Ruffle is sometimes able to bring that back. So we have links on this slide um, to a user guide because there's other features. It's a little bit confusing to just shout features at you. So the user guide's a little bit more helpful in that regard. Um, and there's a splash page online that also has a little bit of an explanation. And as always, there's a GitHub and we welcome um, comments and issues being opened and <laughs> feedback there. And I think Ilya is going to talk a little bit next. Ah, uh, yes, sorry about that. I didn't realize I was muted, so I'll uh, I'll share my screen, actually. The bigger picture that that, that we want to present is sort of uh, sort of what are the components of, of the general web archiving plan that you might have. Uh, and so archive web page 
fills in the capture portion. Then we also have a tool called Re Replay Web Page that generally we, uh, we mentioned as the tool that, that does the, the replay. And then storage is sort of unknown. Uh, but today uh, we have a solution for that. And that is that after we do the capture, the replay and storage will be provided by the Archipelago Digital Repository, which sort of combines both the storage and the replay aspects, as well as a whole lot more that, that we'll get to in, in a little bit. Um, so uh, this is essentially kind of the, the, the bigger picture in a way. So first we'll do the capture, uh, which, which I'll demo. Um, and then uh, we'll focus on the, on the replay and storage, which will be provided by, by Archipelago. Uh, and so with that, uh, I will go ahead and uh, do a quick demo of the archive web page system that we'll use for capture. Uh, so archive web page uh, could actually, um, so it's it's also a website, archiveweb.page. Uh, and from here, you could uh, install it as either a browser extension or as a desktop app. Um, either way is fine. Uh, the browser extension does require a Chrome or a Chromium-based browser. So that includes also Brave and Edge. And so in this case, I already have it installed. Uh, so once you install an extension, uh, it basically appears uh, here in the uh, in the list of extensions. So I could, and then I also have it pinned. So it, it's sort of a, right there. Um, and so I can, uh, with the extension installed, what I can do is I can click on that and I can create, uh, so this is the default name, so I'll call it demo. Uh, and uh, from here, I can click start. So in this case, I'll just use the, uh, the web recorder Twitter uh, profile as an example. And so I can click start. And uh, I'll actually also enable autopilot, which is a brand new feature that, that we recently added uh, that will automatically scroll and interact with a page. So this is especially useful for uh, social media. Um, and so I'll just click on start here. And so it'll uh, reload the page and uh, you can sort of see that it's recording uh, all of this data in the browser. So you can see uh, as it's recording, uh, uh, essentially what, how much data and, and sort of some, some general stats. So this is a, a relatively new feature that we just re-added to the extension. Uh, if you've used Conifer or the uh, older web recorder hosted service, uh, this feature was in a different form there, but uh, sort of the, the uh, general idea is that it automates interactions uh, with uh, complex websites to automatically uh, capture things so, so that you don't have to do this manually. Uh, so in this case, it's basically uh, cl clicking on each of the tweets uh, and scrolling, um, and it's already gotten up to uh, uh, this much data. And actually also shows sort of how much data was downloaded and how much data was stored. So it's also uh, automatically doing uh, deduplication so that duplicates are not, uh, are not stored. And this is kind of a little bit made us since we <laughs> have tweets from previous presentations here. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I can, for example, so just in the interest of time, I will uh, I'll pause this for now. Um, and let's say I also, uh, from here, I could, uh, if I wanted to stop autopilot on this page, and let's say I just wanted to archive the webrecorder.net homepage, which I can click on through here. So I, I can click on it here. And in this case, it'll just auto scroll since uh, there aren't any complex behaviors on this page, but that's essentially what, what it'll do. And so I can kind of do that on uh, on each of the pages. In this case, it's not actually uh, adding that, that much in this case. So, so maybe I'll just, uh, I'll pause the autopilot for now since uh, in this case, uh, it's not necessary. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop recording this page. I can also, um, so for example, I could also run this on, uh, on an Instagram. So I'll go ahead and, so if I enable autopilot on Instagram, it should hopefully go through each of the, uh, uh, each of the posts. And so it'll wait for the page to fully load. And once it does that, it should start. So uh, often there's a couple URLs that are 
couple stragglers that are left. So making sure that that everything's loaded before before it attempts to go. Okay, here we go. So so in the case of Instagram, uh, it is uh, going through each of the each of the posts. Uh, also scrolling down to uh, uh, to get comments. Um, and it sort of times so it doesn't run for too long. And yeah, the, the idea is that it's sort of, uh, it's specifically timed to not run too fast. Uh, so it sort of emulates how a user might, might interact with a page. Um, and then also sort of avoids uh, running into, into any rate limits that might exist. Um, so I will, so yes, yeah, essentially if, if, if I leave this running, it'll, it'll very kind of slowly but methodically go through uh, each, of the, each of the posts here. And so for now, I'll just, I'll just pause this again um, and maybe I will, so another, so another site that Autopilot does support is, is also Facebook, which, is actually the hardest, and it doesn't always work. But I will, I will just try it just just so you you have an idea of, of what what uh, uh, can be done. So uh, Facebook is particularly tricky, but you know that a lot of you a lot of our users are very interested in, in being able to archive Facebook and especially automate uh, clicking on posts and, and videos and, and so forth. Um, and so in this case, uh, what it will do on Facebook is it will, on, on a regular timeline, it will just uh, scroll uh, and expand just the, the very top uh, set of comments, mostly because uh, trying to do too much on one page uh, makes the replay really hard. Uh, and so with Facebook, uh, yeah, so right now it'll, it'll just kind of go go through and, uh, and uh, essentially expand some of these comments. Um, and so maybe I'll stop it here, just so that and kind of show what, what we've archived so far. Uh, so yeah, I will pause that. And maybe I'll stop recording for now. Um, and, and so, what I can do is uh, once the recording is done, uh, I can click on browse archive and then that shows me uh, essentially, so, so this is all in the browser right now, uh, all the pages that, that I've archived so far. And then I can kind of start with, um, with uh, so this is the, the first page that I started with, which was the Twitter feed, I can then, go ahead and uh, click on, on some of these uh, tweets. So everything that that was loaded uh, should, should be available for, for replay here, um, including all of the images, hopefully. Um, and you can also browse some of the other pages. And let's see what how we did with uh, Instagram and Facebook finally. Um, and so th this kind of allows you to uh, to, to to essentially view the archive directly in your browser, um, and so that that essentially so this already is kind of an a, is an archive that exists uh, in your browser, and then uh, we'll also show next is what you could do with this if you want to share this with others and put it into a digital repository, um, and so we can kind of double check uh, a few of the things. Uh, let's see if this video recorded. I don't know if I got this far. Maybe not. Maybe no. I think I stopped here. Stopped at the butterfly. At the butterflies. Okay. Uh, and then with uh, the Facebook. Um, so again, Facebook is always the hardest. But let's see if this worked at all. So I think we. Uh, let's see if the comment expanding works. Yes, in this case it does. So again, I think that if, if I let this sort of 
the longer I, I let it run, sort of the 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 more complex it is to, to replay it. So I think sort of at least the very top few posts uh, should work fairly well. Um, okay, so uh, now I ha have this archive, uh, and uh, what I can do is uh, I could actually. So if I didn't want any of these pages, I could actually also delete them. Um, I, or and I can also choose which pages to download. Uh, and in this case, I'll just go ahead and uh, uh, so download all of them. And so I'll just select uh, so I can download all the pages from from the, the from the collection page. I can also uh, there's also a shortcut here, which does the same thing. So if, if I click on that, I'm going to download uh, all the pages as a waxy file. Um, and uh, that will then allow us to uh, import that file into Archipelago later, as well as and uh, and store it in a repository. And so, um, at this point, I think I'll I'll pause. And uh, basically, the, the next step is for all of you to have a chance to try this out on your own. So you can uh, install Archive Web Page, uh, create a, f a few archives of whatever pages you'd like, and then finally download the data as a waxy file. This is the, the, the hands-on portion. And uh, essentially, this is what, what you could do. Um, here's kind of a, a, brief, a brief overview, and, and we can help answer questions uh, if you have any. So we have a couple of questions. And yes, we can I know, answer questions as well. I know people have already started jumping into trying to archive. So one question that was really good is what does De the debugging message mean? You know how the banner says debugging? Yes, yeah, so that's that's a good question. So that's basically, so in order to be able to archive uh, at full fidelity, so everything that uh, that the browser is loading, uh, we have to use the, uh, basically the debugging feature of, of Chrome, which is a very powerful feature. And so I think for uh, security reasons, Chrome tells you that, that this extension is uh, debugging the browser, which means that basically that it has access to everything that's loaded on the page, which is essentially what we need in order to be able to archive it. Um, so, so it's basically a, a security message from from the browser, um, and I th I think it does make sense. I wish there was a way to to customize it more so that we could say we're debugging because we're archiving, but uh, there isn't a way to do that. So, um, and if if you click cancel, that will stop the archiving, but. Uh, generally, it's better to stop it through the extension pop-up uh, instead of that, but uh, both will work. And would the autopilot run embedded YouTube videos? Uh, currently, it. Uh, uh, I believe that what it does is if you have a YouTube video on a page, it will autoplay it. Um, it does not go through YouTube playlists currently on, on youtube.com, but it does. Um, I believe that if you have, for example, a page that has 10, 10 videos on it, what Autopilot will do is start playing all of them uh, so that they get archived. Another question is, is there a storage limit per page? Good question. Um, the storage limit is essentially what's available in your browser. So it's uh, that there's no limit. Um, and the size is also not entirely, um, the size might not be as entirely accurate because it's it's sort of the uncompressed size. And when we download the data, it's it'll be compressed. So generally the, the waxy file will be smaller than the size that it indicates in the uh, in the extension. And, and we, we are working on fixing that uh, to, to make it a little bit more, more accurate. Um, but in general, no, it's, it's only limited by, uh, by the size of your hard drive. And I know we're taking this time to ask and answer questions, but um, if anyone needs help with installation or how to use archive web page, please let us know. If you feel comfortable, you can go off mute and talk with us. So just let us know via the chat. And another question, does the difficulty of replaying a Facebook page have to do with the size of the recording? Um, partially, it, it has to do with uh, with how Facebook uh, Facebook uses very complex graph queries, basically that use a lot of so it's essentially it queries things differently every time, and so uh, 
and then and they also change these how these queries work and so the drls are never exact and so it essentially has to kind of fuzzy match uh facebook's requ uh, requests to what's what's been archived and so in a way yes so because uh, the more data there is the more the more data there is to to match from um yeah it's it, it's kind of complex I, I at some point i would like to write out more about how all the complexities of, of archiving facebook um but yeah i mean it it, it really is kind of very unarchive friendly i mean I, I think if i wanted to design something that was not archiving friendly it'd probably be something like facebook <laughs> And someone has some waxies from Browser Tricks Crawler already. Would they be suitable as well for our project? Yes, yes. So, so in this uh, in this workshop, we wanted to focus on the archive web page extension. But uh, if you do have waxy files created uh, through Browser Tricks Crawler, then you could also upload those to uh, in the next stage for Archipelago. Yeah. Yeah, all waxy files are the same, basically. It doesn't matter where, you, or in the sense that it doesn't matter where you create. Right. Them. Well, yeah. The the format has gone through several iterations, but yes. But, but basically, yes, uh, it it should work. That's the idea that that you can create uh, waxy files uh, in in many different ways and then upload them. Um, yeah, you're already a step ahead. You're like ready for the next say stage, and. We have a question, another question. Thank you, Diego. Any security concerns we may be aware during a login session to social media, Google, example, session cookies? Good. Yes, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the, the idea is that um, our web page is recording um, all of the, so it, it, if you're already logged in, uh, you won't need to log in and enter your password. So uh, so that's not being recorded, but it does uh, generally record your session cookie uh, because it's needed for for replay. Although, yeah, and 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 it, it's sort of a, a tricky problem because uh, ideally we want to not record things that we don't need to, but oftentimes uh, session cookies are needed for uh, for the page to, uh, to to load properly. And so, uh, yeah, so I think the the, the session cookies generally. Uh, if they are, if they are needed in JavaScript, they are being recorded, I believe. Uh, would you need to run a video in its entirety to capture it, or can you speed it up the process? I have a lot of uh, videos on a government site to archive, and they are very long. Of course, the government. Uh, th that's a great question as well. Uh, it sort of depends on the video player. We actually made it so that with uh, common sites like. Uh, YouTube and Vimeo, and I believe Twitter as well, where we can actually get the entire video as soon as it starts loading. Um, on other sites, if it splits the video into chunks, then you may need to wait for the whole video to uh, to load. Um, perhaps we could figure out a way to, to make that more clear. Um, in, in general, the, uh, oh, sorry, I, uh, I probably sh should have covered this in the, uh, when the extension is running, it shows you how many pending requests there are. Uh, and I can actually probably show this again. Uh, so if I go back to, for example, uh, so if I start archiving here, um, so there's this uh, indicator here that shows how many pending URLs there are. So while this number is not zero, but, but, but uh, when it doesn't say idle, continue browsing, then it's probably loading something. Um, and so actually, I'm not sure if I, uh, so here's a, a YouTube video that, so if I start recording this, um, it will, um, and it actually in this case, so it jumped immediately to 19 megabytes. So in this case, it actually uh, archived this fairly quickly. Um, so it really sort of d d depends on the platform. I, I would say that for, for YouTube, uh, it's fairly safe to assume that that it loads it immediately when, uh, when a video starts playing. Uh, for other systems, it sort of depends. Yeah, I can also attest to, you know, when we embed 
to our websites. There's either, if you embed from YouTube, that helps, but there's also a lot of these customized video players that it gets kind of tricky because they'll have different structures, but yeah. Oh, and well, one other thing I forgot to mention that uh, that we'll also see later is that when you're archiving with Archive Web Page, it is also grabbing the full text search automatically, which you can search for directly in the extension. Uh, so you could enter. So in this case, uh, so it's it's searching both the the text on the page as well as the URL and the title. Um, I guess in the case of Instagram, there's not a whole lot to. Try. Let's see if I try. Uh, so again, it's sort of the, the results vary, of course. Uh, uh, if, but I think so, some of the more text heavy pages do have some some text results here. Um, All right, we have two more questions. And then I hope everyone is really enjoying their archiving process. So we're going to start downloading to a waxy format because we're going to hand the baton off to the archipelago team. But two questions before we transition, and this one I really think is important. Has anyone tested the waxies with a screen reader for blind or low vision users? Um, so the, the waxy format itself is, I mean, that that's basically the, uh, just a format itself. Uh, the system that we have is a, it's called replay web page, which is the, the embeddable viewer. Um, we did a small pass on it for accessibility. Uh, we, we could definitely do a lot more. Um, so I, I think, yeah, the, there's probably more, <clears throat> more that can be done on that. Um, so I think, so the, that would really uh, focus on, on, the, on the viewer uh, component, which we could probably make, make a little bit more uh, accessible. Um, yeah, so that's, so a little bit, but, but not a lot, I think is the answer. I think accessibility and web archiving in general needs a lot more focus and discussion. Yeah. And like, that's something that web archiving in general is aware of, but it's something that we should be discussing more. So as a little plug-in, we are looking for a UX UI designer to work with. Yes. So please yes, absolutely. circulate, because we do think this is important. We just need another team member to help us out with this. And all right. Would you say a dedicated browser profile just for archiving would be a good idea for more secure usage or something else? Ooh, web archiving processes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that, that's actually a good idea. In fact, that, that's what I use. So for example, when, when archiving Facebook, since Facebook requires a login, I created a dedicated profile uh, just for where I'm logged in as, as that user. Um, and yeah, I, I would generally recommend that because that, that sort of keeps things isolated from, from your personal data. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a good idea for, for all the social media sites, really. All right, with that, um, we can hand it over to the Archipelago team. Very exciting. You should have share, screen sharing um, capability. So take over, grab it, do it. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, let's start with introductions. Um, Alison, you go first, please. Hey everybody, I'm Alison Lund. I am the Digital Projects and Metadata Librarian at Metro. Okay, so let's start here. And tiny second. Can you see a presentation that I'm going perfect. to make larger? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So. Um, I'm also going to introduce myself. My name is Diego Pino. I'm a software engineer. I have like a very fancy title, the Assistant Director for Digital Strategy. Uh, same as Alison, I work at the Metropolitan New York Library Council. And I'm from Chile, so thick accent, you will notice that. Um, what I'm going to present today with Alison to, together is this ongoing project that started two years ago, which is Archipelago. Archipelago is an empathic, small, cute, Need a digital repository system. It's open source. Um, it's a reaction to existing systems we're using. It's also full of new ideas. And I'm going to try to make this as painless as possible for you because some of you already know Archipelago. And if not, please make any questions you want. Um, first, Archipelago lives in, in GitHub. It has like 
they're like uh, this archipelago deployment uh, repository where right now on release candidate two, uh, which is like almost like a version three, uh, we're very devoted to our release candidates and it's full of features. Um, let's go to the next one here. So first, uh, some links and facts because you really want to like look what archipelago can do. Um, right now, as I was saying, our release candidate two is just a branch. We have an advisory board. Uh, it's a very diverse and uh, committed advisory board. Most of our members are actually not Archipelago users, which makes everything more flexible and open. Uh, we have an evolving, caring, and growing community. Uh, and also we're extending something that you probably already know, which is named Drupal, right? But we did something a bit different here about why we're extending Drupal. And we took care of all the concerns that normally we feel people want to have control over which is metadata, media, description, and, and search, right? Uh, there's like this pre-release site that you can go, there's like a playground where you can just like log in. Uh, we also have now this playground that you probably have passwords. There's this Google group where we post walls of text that you can like follow up. There's a technical roadmap uh, where we're explaining everything we're doing, why we're doing that, and also like putting our, our, our horizons in place. We have the development repos and also the specs and features document, which explains actually what are the many things that Archipelago does. So just very quickly, Archipelago is basically three core Drupal modules that take over of all the different pieces or concerns that your archival and description needs probably have. And we have something named the strawberry field, uh, which is like a way of storing uh, and exposing row metadata right in a smart way to Drupal basically we're escaping this idea that you have a content model with a few fields and we're allowing Drupal to see a very complicated if you want or very simple if you want a deep nested metadata with an open schema then we have the web from strawberry field which is basically a form builder that allows you to build uh, custom workflows so you can actually like build your own way of cataloging and adding things and it's supposed to be the UI and has a lot of like a lot of nice features like auto saving and embedding of media and, and smart reactions and other things. And then we have format strawberry field, which is like where we started approaching actually uh, the web recorder team here, which is like the way we take this raw metadata that was put via the web form system to the outside via a set of viewers, right? And we cover a lot of bases, so we can like show of course, waxy files, but we also have 3D objects. We have book readers, we have audio and video, metadata displays that can change via a templating system. And basically we try to like cover all the bases, but also we're very AAAF compliant, right? So Archipelago does a lot via AAAF. And I know Elias is already talking to the AAAF people about how web recording and AAAF can mix, which makes me super happy. Uh, but then we also have this other thing because people like to actually fill forms, but sometimes they really want to like bring massive amounts of data. So we have the MEI, which is the Archipelago Mass Importer, which is like a UI driven spreadsheet and CSV and other APIs importer. And it can just like bring your data into that, right? And then we have this runner system, which is basically a system that it can generate or you can generate basically plugins that do something with your digital objects, right? And you can make them run under certain events. And this is the way, for example, right now, how we're transforming work files to Waxy on safe, right? Using the tools that a team at the World Recorder built, right? Um, it's also like a way of deploying, right? It's like you have these pieces, right? But we have also like a very stable way of deploying. So you can actually, if you follow the links that I shared at the beginning, Right, uh, you can actually like have a repository running in like 50 to 20 minutes. And if you're like in Amazon, it's actually 10 minutes, right? It's using Docker Compose. It has like all the configurations to get started. It has a guide from zero to running, which we evaluate every time we have a release to make sure everything is running. And of course, it has like this public roadmap that evolves every time we make mistakes or we don't make mistakes and we have like some lessons learned. Um, very detailed technical diagram of what Archipelago is here. Basically, you have Docker containers, you have a web, right, which is like a Drupal 9 or Drupal 9, Drupal 8 or Drupal 9, sorry, with all the models we built. It has a database, which is like a MySQL 8 or Postgres that stores all your JSON and all the connections between things. It has Solar, the latest version of Solar 8.2. 
uh, which also has like embedded solar high lighting, which is like a collaboration, more like we borrowing code from people in Germany from the like um, Bavarian State Library. And we have Cantaloupe, which is like driving all the media exposure to the world, right? Archipelago doesn't generate actually um, derivatives like over repositories. It generates them in, in real time. So you don't have to like save thumbnails and other things. So Cantaloupe is very important here. And all the data goes into database and all the binaries and like the files and also the data go into Amazon S3 or Minio S3, which is like an open source. We use S3 extensively here because it has like many capabilities that normally a file system won't have, right? One of them is actually the ability of like be able to like make an offset and call these waxy files that can be large, right? Directly in real time. So we can just like go for the waxy file. And when the, the, the viewer actually asks the last piece of the zip file, it can stream that. And there are like other things that are in, uh, interesting there. Um, one particularity about Archipelago is that we're kind of old fashioned and we really believe in files. So when you're saving a digital object, Archipelago also stores your files, sorry, your digital objects as JSON files directly. So you can build static websites or just take your things home when you're like thinking about moving to another system that is not archipelago in the future, if that even exists. Um, last piece here, because I want to actually show you things. Uh, the main reason we actually built archipelago was because we were stuck with an idea in our brains and our souls that didn't match the needs of our community. And that was actually the idea that metadata in the way it was like used in a digital repository was normally canned or like forced into schemas that were of course of like common agreement, but didn't evolve in terms of like the software supporting them as fast as the schemas or the needs of people. Basically what I'm trying to say is like, you have a repository system. The repository system imposes a certain schema like mods or Dublin core, and you're now forced to build your workflow around that schema. And suddenly some people meet, right? And decide there's a new mods, right? And your software is kind of behind, right? And now you're like saving in that schema. So basically metadata, right, uh, is core in Archipelago and we allow actually Archipelago to be shaping your metadata based on your needs, right? So you have like this plus evolving thing, you have a workflow where you can create, right? There's no hard coded models inside the code, right? And it has like the system where you take this raw metadata via template system and it's cast immediately in real time to our formats. So an example is like Allison during the last release candidate on Friday built a mod 3.7 tweet template and previously we had 3.6, right? And now it's working. And some people were like working with finding aids and now Archipelago can deal with 2002, EAD 2002 and EAD version three without us having to code anything, right? And of course, IIIF is evolving. So we have now IIIF collections and everything with your same ingredients, which is this next slide here. Um, two paradigms in repositories, there are probably others, right? But the left one is the most common one here, Acme repository refried beans, right? Your system is made for mods, right? And even if it's like very stable, right? You can like reuse it many times, but you're already forced to put your data into mods. So Archipelago uses this different paradigm where you have to cook, right? Uh, I just put veggie stuff and some cheese there, no meat. Um, but the idea is that your metadata is your ingredients, right? And we have this like tweak template system that casts your raw ingredients, right? Your recipes into other formats, right? So what you actually can do here is like you start with a certain amount of ingredients, the metadata is closer to you, right? You don't have to think actually about like uh, RMM conforming to like bib frame. You just like archi uh, archiving, cataloging and describing the things you know, right? And then you have this basic startup recipes, right? As you grow, you add more ingredients, you don't need to use them. Your recipes are still the same. As you learn to cook better things, you start adding new stuff to your recipes and you make other things happen. Worst case scenario, what you are actually generating is exactly the same as here, right? You're like generating and eating everyday refried beans. But uh, you will notice quickly that you can actually do things that don't require any more software developers. I'm a software developer, but I feel I don't need to be involved in metadata, right? And you can also like grow your system and describe things that are normally right now not in a schema, right? Even feelings, if you want so. Actually, I'm going to show you sentiments during the natural language processing thing. 
This is the way that works, right? You have here on the left, your metadata row and the tweak template. The right here is a mods one and you see it actually looks like mods and we're just like cherry picking things, right? And putting them in different places. I won't go into the details of that. And just quickly, this is like the workflow, a very tiny Google on how things start in Archipelago. So you have this digital object, a single digital object type, right? That only contains a title and this like blob of JSON named the strawberry field the web form that you built or you reuse, right, has multiple steps, right, and fills that strawberry field via JSON. All the uploads goes into a temporary storage. This new about to be born, right, digital object with a tiny tail there, no legs yet, right, uh, sends a lot of like events, right, messages to the to the system, and they're like the subscribers that do stuff, right. They do provenance, they validate, they enrich. They extract waxy text files and other things, right? And it also builds a dynamic vocabulary, right? And then everything that is persisted and also identified. So it has, I will never speak actually, I don't think a single system has like digital preservation capabilities per se, right? But it aids in, right? So basically it extracts checksumming, it does pronom extraction and other things about your files and also stores them safely. And when that happens, the digital object is, is born, it has a unique identifier, a, stable URI, right? And exposes all this extra metadata via like simple ways of access for Drupal and for Solar, it flattens data, right? And then depending on the tab you decided at the beginning, it shows things in different ways and also like allows people to download harvest your metadata as you evolve. And thank you. Hopefully I didn't take like two hours to explain this. Okay, so now I'm going to actually show you an archipelago. And this is one we built yesterday and Sunday with Ilya collaboration and everything. This is the website you probably can access. Uh, we have never tested actually archipelago with like 30 people uploading gigabyte size waxes at the same time. Hopefully we didn't break anything today. It's not a big server, right? It's running on Amazon, uh, but I'm going to just like give you a very quick overview and then we're going to actually upload one Waxy and show you the new features. So I'm not locked in here, it has like a search engine here. You see solar, right? We have like different type of objects. Uh, you have like faceting, like any other repository. And I'm going to show you this one here, right? It has like mirror door viewer in this case, it's like triple AF driven. We have linked data elements. There's a lot of linked data happening in Archipelago. You have maps, right? And you have all these different displays, right? And you have your AAAF presentation manifest. So this is like totally invisible to you as an end user, but everything here is driven by a single piece of JSON and these templates are transforming data, right? So this year is driven by the same JSON that you have, transform it into GeoJSON this year into HTML, this into like a AAAF manifest with a viewer, this also in HTML, etc. And of course, let me search again. I'm going to select here web pages, right? And you can see different web pages here. Um, let's look actually at this one here. This is like the web recorder homepage, right? And it's a very nice one, right? You have like some title, URL of the original website, description, type of resource. And we can of course like use an embedded viewer, right? provided by the team, search inside, look at stuff, et cetera. Why having a repository connected to something that is already awesome, like a Waxy file is actually important uh, because you can actually start connecting things with the metadata about the metadata, right? So uh, web archiving from my experience, which is not too much, right? Um, has this like open place for starting to think about metadata. It's like, what are the things that we're talking about inside a website, right? Or subjects, what are the people we're referring to, right? Uh, even like technical metadata, it's like, what is the process that we actually use to like capture this website, right? And when you start thinking about collections of multiple Waxy files, you also like can go into like the collection management thing, right? It's like, are we actually collecting things, right? around the topic or I'm actually collecting things time-based, right? And have like multiple captures for the same page in different month. And each one can have like different subjects. So before I actually go here, I'm actually going to log in. Um, you have users, if you can, if you want to follow along, please use your users. If you don't, that's also okay. I'm going to log in with a very simple user, the demo user. Now I'm logged in here, right? And I'm going to actually start adding first a new Waxy file to show you the, the workflow of that, right? And then we're going to actually see how searching works, right? 
and also like how we embedded recently, kind of like last night, internal waxy search into the global archipelago discovery system. If I speak too fast, please let me know. Um, let's start here with the tools. I'm going to add content. So as I said very quickly, Archipelago doesn't have very specific content models. The content models are driven by your workflows. So you have basically two types, digital objects and digital object collections. Digital objects are basically item level objects. Digital object collections are anything that is grouping other type of objects together. It can be actually a collection, the way you know it. It can be also like a creative work series. It can be like a newspaper with multiple issues. We're going to start actually with the digital object. So these forms here that you're seeing are totally customizable. And Alison is going to like jump very quickly and explain you how we can modify this web form to make it more aware of like web archiving. But I'm going to use the default one. This is what you get when you deploy Archipelago using the instructions. So I'm going to write here Library of Congress subject, subject headings. This is something I captured while uh, Ilya was like showcasing. And I'm going to select here a media type. You see, like we have multiple different types, web page. The moment I select web page, these forms have like three years. So they're changing here the URL of the website. And I want to actually use the starting website, which is this one I started. There, the description, I'm going to actually copy this whole thing here because I'm very lazy. I'm not a cataloger. Did I say that? I'm a software developer. And the date of the original, I'm assuming this is kind of older. So I'm just going to put 2018, all right? Okay, someday in 2018. Here's like with the fun part, creator, right? So I have like unmapped elements and I have like created link data. So I'm going to actually generate here a corporate one. And let's see if Library of Congress has actually Library of Congress. Library, sorry, Library of Congress, they have that, perfect. So now I have to create a URI with the link data, right? And the role here is creator. Sorry, I'm very bad at typing. And now we have the role, right? So the publisher is actually the same one here and the language is English. Good, and I'm going to move to the next step. And now I'm going to select your collection membership, known, it's not part of anything. The institutional owner here is Metro actually. The local identifier is going to be like web page. 001-001 and the date of digital is actually today. Write statements, uh, we're using here controlled write statements. You can also use your own, right? And um, let's go here for like educational use permitted, right? Next step. And now we have a lot of more linked data, right? So we're going to actually go here for like this uh, vocabularies, vocabulary, okay, good. Personal names, I'm going to use this. Corporate names, I'm going to use Library of Congress again. Library of Congress, Congress, good. Um, I'm going to go for Wikidata, and this is like a linked open data, good, because we're like storing a website about subject headings. And I'm going to add another one, and this is like a web archive. Okay, good. And this is also like a library there. And you see, we have also Getty, BF, and OpenStreetMaps location. We can just like search an address and it will fill up latitude, longitude, and things. All these pieces I'm showing you here is like something Alison built for this, like basically deployment, but you can mix and match. You can decide that you want to use all the vocabularies, et cetera. And finally, the piece you're waiting for attaching, right? Uploading a file. So in this case, I'm going to actually upload two files, a screenshot, so we can actually see that on the page and a waxy file I downloaded, which has only three pages, it's super simple. So let's go for this. And I have the splash page here, good. And also extract immediately EXIF, so you can see, okay, this is the thing I really wanted to upload, right? And now the web archive should be like this waxy file here, super small. And now I save my metadata. So now I'm almost ready. And I need to decide what type of like workflow I want to use. Do I want to make this draft and like keep everything or do I want to like publish this immediately, right? This workflows here define triggers like making this public or not, but you can always have new workflows. So it can be like in archivist still needs to look at this, right? Uh, as like the, I don't know, like the collection owner, et cetera. So I'm going to move from draft to published. Uh, I have also like revision information here. 
I can say that. And I can also like, of course, decide if I want to force a way of viewing. By default, if I select the website, it will use the web archive viewer, right? So saving, let me see if this works. And uh, uh, um, if you're like doing the same, you will see that. And now we have the subjects, the object was created and we have the website, right? So that was kind of simple, right? Not a big deal. Of course, you don't need to use the same type of elements, right? And you don't need to go into the deeps of like filling up the different things. But now your website is connected to the world via linked open data, right? You can also search inside for that, right? Or you can also like go there and you can connect your things together. So what is extra here? If I press on this top element here, you see first that page I just added is not indexed yet. Archipelago has like a background processor that will take your pages, will extract the text and will do that. And I'm going to trigger that manually. It works when the system is like under lower uh, load or every certain amount of time. And it's running right now. But this here is the other things that we just recently added. Some of them like by Ilya, some of like demo elements and the homepage that you saw, right? So first, this is like kind of the same functionality or similar that you had internally in the viewer, but now repository wide, right? So let's search for YouTube here. Okay. And you have like just different things here in YouTube and you see this also like is pointing to YouTube, good. And it's also, let me remove this here, using natural language processing to extract from the main body of text of each page entities, right? That happens in index. So you see have like extract locations here and not always will actually match because it's natural language, right? It's not smart natural language. Uh, but it will also like extract things here, right? That are kind of like facetable, right? So like I have now here like Andrew and I can see that, right? Okay, so let me show more here, show all and show you, hopefully this works. So let's say I'm using IPFS, right? And that's like the homepage. So if I go there, it's actually pointing directly to the homepage, right? Let me go back, okay, show that. And um, let me check this. Um, Google one. Okay, that's the home page again. Gosh, I need something different. Uh, uh, um, let's actually search for here. Let me see, we have here contact. Okay, contact. Search, we have a high line here, right? Let me press on that one. Okay, and it's a contact page, right? So you see, it's actually using something that the team at the Web Recorder built, which is like integrating. Many of the things are like basically reused, right? Um, a fragment on the URL passing exactly the page, right? And it's pointing into that. Uh, I think it was like named deep links or something like that earlier, right? And it does that. Yes. So, perfect. So just to be sure, we also have the things I just uploaded, right? Into the index, I'm going to log out here. I'm going to log in quickly as an admin user, right? Oh, admin, and which is my admin password, which I probably have forgotten. Tiny second, just change the password. And of course I forgot it. Alison is laughing at me, probably. And what was the password? Oh, I got it. Slack is the best. Okay. Log in. There you go. Okay. So update the password. Okay. Thank you. So right now, all the things I just added are in the queue, waiting to be processed automatically. So I'm just going to go here to my configuration, my system. This is like my admin interface, right? And I'm going to go to my queue manager and let me see if this is like already running. It's already running. Okay. Let me check again. Uh, um, content. This one here. I want to show you how it runs. Okay. Evit, save. Okay. Perfect. Let me check here the queue runner. Did I make a mistake? Probably. Don't worry about that. Um, Alison, I'm going to like give it back to Alison. Um, Alison is going to quickly show you how you can customize the web form to add more data based on actually some work that uh, Sumitra Duncan with uh, a fellow for, um, um, from Pratt for the Freak um, collection did. And I'm just going to give back that to Alison and Thank you. And I'm going to also look at the Slack, sorry, the chat, if you have questions. No, no problem. And actually, um, I am right now sharing uh, 
copy of a archipelago multi-importer ingest uh, based on Mona's question in the chat. And um, just to kind of follow along uh, or follow up a little bit more with your question about what you would need to do um, to, to upload in batch, you would just uh, want to pair your, your uh, ingest spreadsheet and your ingest template if you're using that route to match the metadata elements or profile or whatever you're going for for your, for your um, batch ingest. So you can see this in an example. Um, this is part, this uh, particular spreadsheet, a copy of this is part of the new release candidate to uh, local deployment instance. Um, so just an example of how you can see how it's kind of structured and you have your metadata elements and the information all, all prepared for that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, so first up, the view that I have is just a little different than the demo user that you're using because I am logged in as an administrator and so it uses a different theme. Um, so just something to be aware of. And um, now I'm going to go over to the web forms uh, section. I have it bookmarked, but if you didn't, you would go to manage structure and then it's under the, the web forms link there. So um, as Diego was saying, working with the a student from Pratt at um, as part of the Web Archives Interest Group that Ilya and um, Emma and, and Lorena have also uh, been involved with. Uh, we uh, we got this student set up so that they could kind of customize the metadata for a collection that he was putting together on behalf of the New York Art Resources Consortium. And one of the first things that he decided that he wanted to do was prepare a list of additional website types. Um, that he thought it might be helpful to have. So for, for, for NIARC, that was things like online exhibition, museum, arts organizations, digital art, that kind of thing. Um, so today I'm just going to demonstrate adding how easy it is to kind of like customize this for whatever particular uh, metadata elements you're, you're interested in including. So um, I'm going to use an autocomplete. You could also search for here and it pairs down that, that big long list if you, if you need to. Um, so I'm just gonna do that. And I'm just going to add a, a short list of website type. Now this right here, the key uh, becomes the JSON key in your metadata where this, the values from this particular element will be, will be going. Um, I am going to do some custom options right now. So we're going to add say a blog. Um, it's a little slower because I'm on Zoom. Social media. And I will go with college or university website. Now for this, um, I'm just going to keep that limit of 10, and three contains, I'm just going to save this. And it got added at the bottom of the page. So I'm just going to uh, pop this up a little higher. So it's on the first page. Sorry. <laughs> keep going. And I'll just put it right under media type. So if you had a list of website types that you're interested in adding, you could, you could do that. And now I'll go back out to content and you can see uh, that will appear. We'll go with Retro Grinnell site, the college website. And I'll edit it and using the form, uh, I'll have the option to search for it right there. Um, so I'm gonna save this and I will just really quickly, uh, Diego and everyone is okay, just demonstrate how you might add this to your metadata display because you're not going to see it. Um, or we can just move on to a different part. I'm totally okay. Please go for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so for Archipelago, you have different uh, metadata display templates that you can set up for how you want to share your or display or otherwise like share your object. So you can see there's one for mods 3.7. So I have an example of what that looks like. You just that output for mods for uh, the Monona Beach Web Archive object um, that you can you can see when you're logged in or even not logged in because it's published. Um, so today I'm just going to be editing the object description template and adding in the website type um, to demonstrate adding it. I'm going to add it above the contributors. So 
first I'm going to bring up the preview. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. We're going to go with the retro Grinnell site. And it's going to pop up over here. I'm going to select this so that it shows the rendered uh, HTML there. And you can see it's not there. Now, I had prepared this ahead of time, so I'm just going to copy and paste it from uh, Notepad. Right now, for adding this particular value, it's set up um, in this in this format. We have documentation about uh, Twig template editing and how you need to structure it so you can have um, object or uh, elements or fields that might have multiple values. It's it's a little different than something such as title, where it's just one simple thing like this. Um, but anyways, there's more information about that over there. And show preview. And if this object had it, it would show there. Um, but I'm just going to save, and then you'll be able to see uh, that pop up on, on your end and on the published objects as well. So we'll go back out and add that value to the retro Grinnell site. Oh. Maybe it did show up. It was saved. OK, so it should show up now. Um, OK. And it should be right there. So that is, that's it. It's as simple as that. Um, and now, I guess with that, I will turn it back over to the uh, web recorder team, and we can move on to the next part of the workshop. Thanks, Diego. Yeah, this is, this is really awesome. Uh, and uh, I was thinking maybe I, I could kind of to complete my initial demo, I, I'll share my screen and upload the, the WAXI file that I created earlier. Uh, so let me go ahead and do that. Uh, So and so I'll log in as one of these users. So now I'm logged in here and I think now on the right uh, on the right tab. So I'll go add content. And so I'm, so I'll just call this demo waxy. And and uh, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll actually web page a little like misleading two because it's probably more than one web page that's true. yeah perhaps it should be called web archive uh, as a media type that that might also make sense and so then i will uh, sorry just, no it's uh, totally fine and, and this is like another question about like it's like an excellent question well, about like the, the effect that people have or like we as a community have over actually linked open data vocabularies right Mm -hmm. So, for example, schema.org doesn't define anything extra, right, than actually a web page as like an entity okay. uh, pass, right? But then uh, if we go like to a different thing that doesn't sound like website, it makes sense. We have actually archival packages, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very generic. So it's like for finding aids, for example, EADs where we have like 100 containers plus all the things, we're using that, right? Uh, for a yeah. web page, we don't know, and it's it's true. Like a web page will be actually a single web page, right? So um, we probably Alison need to like think about that deeper. But also schema.org now driven by Google and with not too many revisions possible is not an easy task to push. Right, and I think in general the the web archiving field has sort of had there really isn't any agreed upon metadata standard. Unfortunately, I think it's sort of very much. For example, Archive, it has its own kind of metadata approach. Yeah. Uh, Web Recorder hosts uh, kind of had a different approach. Now we're, we're sort of, uh, we're hoping that with the, perhaps with, uh, with, yeah, with more collaboration and having like a, a format like Waxy, we can actually uh, work towards standardizing something 
Yeah, um, I feel like so. I'm like forcing sort of archival metadata schemas on web archives a lot of the time when I know it's not really enough or like not accurate. It's like a lot of forcing of different metadata standards on our collections that don't really fit. So one way to troubleshoot, it's the, the good thing about using the archive webpage is you can't, so let's just say you went on an archiving spree and did so many websites, you can select the specific pages to the website and or even delete pages that you're like, oh, that wasn't even related to the website. And then you can kind of curate it in the archive webpage part download that waxy that way when you upload it to archipelago it would only be focused on that website you do have the capability of selecting and deleting pages which is nice because that's not something other tools will do it's like all or nothing but here you can select it's extra steps but you can at least manually customize it that way it will just be that one website yep yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so here's the, so I, I uploaded that uh, demo file just real quickly uh, if you're logged in. And I think, yeah, so here's a link to, to that archive, that Waxy file that I created earlier. Um, and so you could, you could view it from here in, in the Archipelago repository. Um, and yeah, so this embedded viewer is essentially the, the same, uh, pretty much the same UI as you see in our web page, uh, which is coming from a replay web page, and that's kind of by design. Um, and uh, I think the uh, the full text search index is, is probably in the queue right now, so it'll be generated eventually. And so I can uh, that it's ready. Yeah, you can search for oh, it already. It's ready. Great. Yeah. So 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 then I, I I go to and so let's see if I search for if I search for Instagram. Let's see if it'll if it'll show up. Um, well, there's there's a few other uh, Instagram. There's another one. So so here's my. Yeah, so, so, so here's the, uh, the demo waxy file that I just uploaded and you can have the, uh, the, the full text search here and you could search across. I, I just think this, this, this is so cool that, that we have search not, a, not only across a single web archive, but across multiple web archives and also across multiple digital objects that are in, in your repository. And this is all uh, uh, thanks to Diego's kind of last minute work. This is all, uh, this is all just added within the last uh, within the last 24 hours. And Some it within the last hour. Yeah, and it might explode in like 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but so this is sort of the real uh, cutting edge work and couldn't have done it without Diego. So uh, I'll, I'll do a couple Thank more you. searches. Okay. Um, right. If you want, yeah, you can feel free to email us your collections and if you feel so comfortable, we can do a little highlight over Twitter, love curations. Uh, yeah, or, right. or, or if you want to come back and, and upload something later after this workshop, feel free, so we'll, we'll keep it around. But yeah, uh, it seems like uh, we should probably wrap up. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Allison and Diego for- Allison, Diego, for, amazing. Uh, Okay. Thank you. If you're using Archipelago, change your passwords. You all have the same passwords. That's yes. super unsafe. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, our super secret <laughs> password needs to be changed. So please feel free to change it. Yep. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you, team. You're like amazing. And the web recorder the team is just like so committed. It's just like inspiring. So thank you, people. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, be on the call today. Take good care. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.